So, okay, let's start with uh, this second talk, which is devoted to organ motion management. And uh, as I told you before, I will uh, also use some concepts we have already seen in, in, in my first presentation here. When we speak of organ motion in radiation oncology, it's quite clear to all, I think, that we speak especially of respiratory motion. But we have to be aware that we have different sources of, of motion in radiation therapy. Respiratory motion is, of course, the most important. It's a pseudo-regular motion. It's not completely regular, as all we know. It's a predictable in a very short interval, if needed. And uh, I, I'm going to show you later why we think that it's uh, necessary to predict respiratory motion in some applications. But we also have a skeletal muscular motion, which is an irregular, completely irregular motion that can be controlled, uh, asking the patient to, to cooperate and using a, a positioning device that you have uh, seen in the previous presentation. We also have cardiac motion, which is generally not explicitly accounted for in radiation therapy. Okay. We have gastrointestinal motion, which is unpredictable, totally unpredictable, but can be partly limited. And we have motion of the genital urinary, uh, urinary system, in particular bladder filling, uh, which is important uh, in uh, prostate uh, treatment, for example, and especially if we, we use uh, hypofractionation techniques uh, that take uh, a very long time. For example, I have a, a, a direct personal experience uh, with hypofractionation in prostate uh, that uh, was uh, a given in fractions of 40 to 45, even 60 minutes uh, sometimes. And in that time, of course, we have a problem of bladder filling that uh, results uh, in uh, a generally a rotation of the prostate uh, of several degrees. It can reach up to 7, 8, or even 9 or 10 degrees. It can be partly limited with the cooperation and education of the patient as uh, once again you have uh, heard in the previous presentation. But for, for my part now, I have this choice. I will uh, devote my time today with you on just respiratory motion. Okay? And in particular, I will do it by uh, analyzing the principal lines that we see in this important document of the AAPM, which is Management of Respiratory Motion in Radiation Oncology, which is not particularly new now. It was published in the year 2006, but still is a very important uh, uh, report, uh, which is called the report of the TG76 uh, for, for respiratory motion in radiation therapy. So uh, we start by having a look at what anatomical sites we are dealing with when we talk of respiratory motion. Of course, we expect respiratory motion in lung. And for shallow breathing, which means superficial breathing, not forced, okay, we have descriptions in the literature of motion that can reach up to five centimeters for the lung. For the esophagus as well, we have important displacements. We have displacements of the liver up to four centimeters with normal respiration. We have the <coughs> movement of the pancreas, which is uh, uh, also very important. Pancreas is thought to be an organ that is quite fixed, uh, very deep in the anatomy, but still it's very subject to motion due to respiration. Three to three to 0.5 centimeters is a normal range of motion in normal respiration for the pancreas which is a, really a problem because it's quite close to very critical structures. So if we have an approach of high doses in radiotherapy for the pancreas, which, which is required because pancreas uh, does not really respond well to low doses, it's a, really a problem of toxicity for the uh, nearby tissues. The breast is, uh, uh, moves with respiration. Even the prostate moves with respiration, even if this is generally not accounted for in any way. But think, for example, of some techniques uh, which uh, uh, fortunately are not common that treat the prostate in the prone position. If you put the patient in the prone position, you have a, a more um, severe problem of displacement due to respiration than in the supine position. So you have to be aware of that, of course. And for kidney as well, you ha can reach several millimeters. This is a, a um, table taken for, from APM task group 76 that uh, shows you the um, displacement reported from the literature seen in the literature for lung lesions. Uh, 
<coughs> and it is divided in three columns, which are superior, inferior motion, anterior, posterior, and uh, lateral motion, okay? As we expect, the most important motion of lung lesions is in the, in the superior, inferior direction like this, because it is due to the motion of the diaphragm, okay? Which in inspiration makes the lesion go down, and in expiration makes the lesion go up. This is the most important, and as you can see, the various sta studies that are reported here uh, give a displacement uh, of nine to three, nine millimeters, uh, sorry, to three centimeters, this up to five centimeters, three and a half centimeters, and so on. In the anterior posterior direction, it's uh, less important, but still it's a, a, a big range of motion, it can reach up to two to 2.5 centimeters, and it is generally observed for lesions that are in the upper part of the lung, okay? Uh, if you think of a, a person which is breathing, normally you have uh, an anterior posterior displacement like this uh, in the, this part, uh, but when you go down and you're close to the, fra the diaphragm, the, the um, motion that you expect is the, in, in the superior inferior direction like this. And this is important if you describe a motion with uh, an external monitor, for example, which always uh, goes uh, practically up and down in the anterior posterior direction, okay? Please be aware, do not think that uh, any external monitor is describing exactly the direction of motion what, of what is uh, uh, really inside. This is a similar table for uh, uh, abdominal uh, regions, the pancreas, liver, and kidney, and you can see here that motion of the pancreas is reported up to 3.5 centimeters, which is a, a, an important range of motion, of course. The sources of information that we can use to measure or to account for motion in imaging are the one reported here. Uh, we have radiography, of course, a double exposure or a cine modality. We have fluoroscopy with or without fiducial markers that uh, can give us some information on the uh, pattern of motion of a lesion, if it's quite visible. We have ultrasound, but the most important tool that we have is once again CT, and in particular for DCT if available, that is uh, able to describe uh, in a complete and entire cycle of respiration, uh, giving you the information of different volumes uh, pertaining to the different instants within the respiratory cycle. We will see a, a, a movie in, in a while describing this. We also have MR and for DMR, but these are uh, very mm, less common techniques, uh, very difficult to be used, and we, as we have seen before, we have PET and 4D PET, uh, which is uh, uh, already quite common in, uh, in uh, various centers now. Of course, patient training is very important if we have to deal with motion. Uh, this, for example, is a graph which is taken from a, a, a study coming from 2006, uh, which shows you the variability of the respiratory patterns in free breathing with no patient uh, instructions and cooperation compared to an analogous uh, cohort of patients uh, for which uh, instructions and uh, audiovisual feedback uh, was uh, used. And it's quite clear how the variability is much more restricted if you use uh, uh, things like this. Other strategies can be the administration of oxygen, for example, to allow patients that breathe with difficulty to be more cooperative and to maintain a, a, a predictable pattern of respiration. The APM TG76 uh, report that we have seen uh, uh, gives you several uh, uh, levels of uh, motion management, uh, starting from motion encompassing techniques, uh, which are the most uh, easy to do, going up to respiratory gating in, uh, in increasing complexity in, in this way, and then with breath hold techniques, uh, forced shallow breathing techniques, and uh, the mo probably most refined from the technological point of view, which is tracking uh, or respiration synchronized techniques. Uh, I will try to uh, show you some considerations on at least three of these levels, which are motion encompassing, uh, gating, and tracking in increasing uh, level of complexity. 
for motion encompassing. Motion encompassing means uh, that we uh, estimate the position of a lesion a target, like this one, this red dot one, for example, in, uh, say, expiration. Uh, then we estimate the position of the same lesion in inspiration, for example, or in the two extreme um, ends of the respiratory cycle. And then we build an, what is called an ITV, an internal target volume, defined in, in this document here, which is built, uh, uh, putting together the clinical target volume with the internal margin, and uh, can be represented, for example, f with this dotted line here. And on this volume, you build a dose distribution that encompasses uh, the whole trajectory of the lesion, okay, uh, which is taken during the, the motion due to uh, respiration. Of course, the main limitation of this study, th it is quite easy to do, even if you do not have a real 4D CT, okay, with uh, the cooperation of the patient, a normal respiration, and uh, a, mm, a, a CT taken in full inspiration and full expiration in, during normal breathing, you, you can actually estimate the range of motion like this. The main limitation of this is that, of course, it takes a lot of volume. You have to irradiate a lot of uh, healthy tissue to be sure that the, your dose distribution, which is static, covers something that is uh, actually moving within it, okay? So you're not sparing uh, that much organs at risk and uh, surround destruction by using this technique. But it's easy, it's readily available in practical all centers, uh, and uh, allows you to miss the target in a small fractions of, of, of cases. This is an example of motion encompassing. This is taken from a, a real um, treatment that was uh, performed some years ago. And here you see the uh, situation of the, uh, of the lesion in this uh, sagittal plane, which I uh, uh, suggest you to see rather than the other ones. Okay, this is the position of the lesion in full expiration. This is the dose distribution that is built around the lesion to cover it. And uh, this is the situation in full uh, inspiration. Okay, so in inspiration you see that the lesion moved here. In expiration moves here. The dose distribution is fixed and the lesion moves to within the dose distribution. Okay, this is the concept of uh, motion encompassing technique. Well, motion encompassing techniques, of course, still requires margins for uncertainty in position, okay? Do not confuse this one with the, uh, the uh, concept of passing from CTV to PTV for setup errors. Setup errors are uh, to be accounted for separately for this motion, okay? And this is the concept of gating. Well, the main limitation of uh, motion encompassing was that we had the whole trajectory. We had to move the lesion within a large dose distribution, okay? So why not using, for example, a fixed, fixed position like this and uh, switching the beam off when the lesion is moving like this? Okay, this is the concept of uh, respiratory gating in uh, treatment delivery. We deliver the treatment just in the phase uh, that we have taken in our CT. We have planned the uh, treatment in this phase, uh, and then we have a system at the accelerator which is able to shut the beam off when the position is not the position that we uh, used for, for treatment planning. Okay, this is respiratory gating. Of course, the main advantage of this is that we can spare volume, in this case, compared to the other one. The limitation is that we get very long treatment times. It depends, of course, on the fraction of the respiratory cycle that we want to use to do this. If we want to use 25%, uh, uh, for example, of the respiratory cycle, we have treatment times that require four times uh, the beam on time compared to, to uh, the motion encompassing technique. If we use, uh, because we want to be more precise, just uh, one in 10 phases, uh, we of course have 10% of beam on time, which is useful, so we have times which can be 10 times longer for treatment delivery which, of course, is a problem from, from, from the clinical point of view. But still, this is the concept of a, a respiratory gating. Sorry. 
Respiratory gating is uh, uh, made, performed by means of systems like this one. You need uh, an external marker, which can be a block like this one, this seen from an external camera, okay? And it's important to understand that what you are looking at is uh, something that is not really the tumor. You are looking to an object uh, that normally goes up and down in the anterior posterior direction like this, while the tumor very often moves uh, like this in the superior inferior, so you have to be aware of this. And uh, especially you have to be aware of problems uh, like the one reported here. Here you have uh, on the left uh, a case where the motion of the external marker that you use on the chest or abdomen of the patient uh, is described by the green line. The motion of the tumor is described by the blue line, okay? In the left panel, they are very uh, superimposed to each other. So if you use the marker motion to give the bemoan time, you are quite sure that you are irradiating the tumor when the tumor is within the window, good for treatment, which is uh, uh, enclosed by these two lines here. But if the correlation between the external motion and the motion of the tumor is uh, bad or is not constant in time, you can get a situation like this one where you get the uh, bemoan time corresponding to the marker motion within the window, but this situation does not correspond to the tumor motion within the window. So you are irritating the tumor or you are missing the tumor because it's not really in the window that uh, it, were, it was planned for, for the treatment. So this is another important limitation of gating uh, together with the limitation due, uh, to, to long uh, treatment time. Well, and this is uh, the concept of tracking. Tracking is uh, uh, not uh, very um, used today. Uh, we have just uh, uh, very few uh, systems that can really do uh, a, a tracking, a respiratory tracking for, for radiation therapy, but the concept is to spare the volume together with time by redirecting in real time the beam while the tumor moves like this. Okay. You build a dose distribution around the, the target and then you redirect, you move the beams uh, to move the dose distribution while the target moves. This is done, for example, by uh, this, yes, by this machine here, which is uh, based on an industrial robot uh, on which, on top of which is mounted a linear accelerator. And by using the uh, all degrees of freedom of the robot, uh, the system is able to follow in real time the motion of uh, the tumor. This is one of the very few systems available today for tumor tracking. But there are studies uh, for uh, using a multi-leaf collimator, for example, for tracking, uh, which probably will become available in shortly in, a, in a probably a few months or a few years. What is the problem of uh, uh, tracking? The problem of respiratory tracking is probably you have already seen uh, in my previous uh, uh, slide, that if you build a dose distribution around your target here, and if you have uh, an organ at risk here, which might be the spinal cord, for example, okay, you make a dose distribution by planning in one single phase, and then you switch on the system, and the actual dose distribution is not what you planned, but involves uh, the organs at risk that are around the lesion. Okay. So the solution to this is uh, that you need a real 4D planning. It's not like in motion encompassing or in gating, where you just need a, a simple CT for simulation. Okay. Here you need a real 4D CT because you, you need a description of all the respiratory phases and you have to build a dose distribution which takes into account all the situations in the various respiratory phases that you have. And for example, uh, there has been the um, evidence in the literature in the past of a, a real 
uh, deformation of the uh, dose distribution due to this effect here. So it's really a thing to be made with uh, very um, with, with much attention. Okay, problem in motion control include also imaging, of course. We have to be sure that we are using uh, good imaging, proper imaging to describe the situation that we are going to, to find at treatment. In particular, we need a temporal coherence between imaging for treatment planning and uh, treatment delivery, treatment administration. Imaging shall always describe the treatment condition. This is very important. And this is especially important. We have already seen in the previous talk something if, if we use uh, quantitative imaging to describe uh, uh, the tumor or to describe the target that you want to irradiate, and in particular if you use PET-CT to describe a biological target volume, a BTV. This is what you get in CT if you do not control respiration. You see here that we have motion artifacts. Uh, I'm sure that all of you are uh, aware of this problem here, and this is the correct uh, coronal uh, slice corresponding to it. And this is the image of a, a sphere taken at CT in uh, static condition and uh, in, uh, uh, on top of a table that simulates uh, the, uh, a normal respiration. And of course, what you get is an object that does not have the volume and does not have the shape of the real object that you had to, to scan. And this is another important uh, part. You can solve this problem in particular if you have uh, uh, a tracking uh, system with 4D CT. 4D CT is a modality in which you have a CT scanner and an external reference like the blocks we have seen for, for gating uh, before at the accelerator that allows you to co make in correspondence each single slice with the instant within the respiratory cycle in which that slice was taken. Okay? And this allows you to sort the slices to build N 3D volumes corresponding to the single uh, respiratory cycle. Okay? This is what you need absolutely if you use tracking. But once again, if you uh, just use gating or a uh, motion encompassing technique, uh, uh, even a, a normal CT simulator or CT is uh, enough to, to get uh, good information. For this CT, you can use a prospective or a retrospective acquisition. Br very briefly, the prospective acquisition uh, allows you to acquire the volume just in the respiratory cycle that is of interest to you, and this results in dose sparing, of course, uh, but you have limited information on the whole respiratory cycle. Or you can use retrospective sorting, in which you have a redundant acquisition of the whole volume, okay, continuously, and, and uh, a sorting which is made just after the acquisition was, was taken. You have, of course, higher dose here, but full information on the whole respiratory cycle, and this is uh, what you need if you, if you use uh, for the planning for uh, tracking, for example. Okay, this is just the uh, concept I had already uh, told you before. Yes, please. Th that is a strategy that, uh, that is good, in my opinion. If you want uh, to use MIP, you, uh, MIP allows you to get a description of the whole range of motion, right? Uh, we do that uh, in some cases. In some other cases, we use a, a real 4D CT, and then we estimate the envelope of positions uh, when we build the, 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 the CTV. One important consideration to do is that you do not uh, normally need a, a high number of phases to get a good uh, result. For example, if you um, compare uh, what happens with 11 phases, which is a, a standard in, uh, um, which is a standard, a uh, gold standard, I would say, for DCT, to six phases, uh, you have uh, an average dosimetric error, which is just 0.3%. If you compare 11 to two phases, you get 1.5%. If you compare 11 phases to an average phase, uh, which is uh, made uh, averaging uh, the, the, the two uh, phases,
space is taken here, for example, you have 2% error. You make a big error just if you compare the 11 phases with just one uh, instep in the respiratory cycle. So the message is uh, uh, do not aim for a high number of phases if you, if you uh, use it for DCT. Just be aware that uh, resolving the respiratory cycle within different times, just two times, is enough to uh, get uh, a good situation for uh, the dosimetric point of view. For magnetic resonance, I would not uh, spend much time on uh, 4DMR because it's really not a, 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 a modality which is already used for treatment planning today. Still, you can do breath hold here. You have some cine mode or very short acquisitions like uh, ecoplanar imaging that allow you to, to uh, do very fast imaging and get uh, uh, the different instance of the respiratory cycle. Real 4D techniques are not so common and they can use external surrogate signal, for example, or internal surrogate signal like the position of the diaphragm and so on. But once again, it's uh, really still in the um, research phase rather than a real clinical application. So if you're, um, allow me, I will skip this part on the MR just to go to PET-CT, which is much more important in the definition of uh, the biological target volume to irradiate. This is really very much used today. PET is a, a real quantitative uh, uh, imaging modality, as we all know. We do not have just FDG, which is the, the common modality. I would say it's 99% of the use of PET-CT today. But we also have applications in radiation therapy with uh, different traces, like uh, fluoromisonidazole here, which is a, a marker of uh, hypoxia together with copper ATSM and so on. All these modalities have uh, in common a problem, which is the very low signal-to-noise uh, ratio and the fact that uh, motion can be really a problem for, uh, for their use. I have already uh, shown you this uh, slide in the previous talk. Uh, once again, it's a, a comparison between uh, the SUV, maximum SUV, that you get in this lesion here if you do not take motion into account. Here we have uh, an SUV which is below two, which is quite low, okay? Could be even mistaken by, uh, for, for, for a, a benign lesion if you do not see the real uh, situation here. But if you control motion, you have uh, SUV uh, values which are much higher. Once again, this is a very extreme case. Fortunately, not all the lung lesions uh, behave like this, but uh, it can be an example of what is really happening in reality and how motion control techniques uh, can uh, uh, help you getting the, the, the real situation. Motion is, uh, of course, a problem of uh, quantification here because uh, it uh, uh, has a huge impact on quantification. And the methods that we have today for control of motion in PET are uh, scanners like these, which are equipped uh, with uh, a 4D PET system. This is a, a, a variant system, which is called RPM, which is uh, uh, the same system that in our center we use in one of the linear accelerators. So we have a, a, a couple of systems, one in PET-CT, the other one at the accelerator, and uh, allows us to get uh, 4D information like this. This is another very extreme case, which in my opinion is uh, uh, quite interesting. On top, uh, we see a lesion, which is uh, this one, okay, taken uh, with no motion control, which is uh, a, in, the, in, in full acquisition during the whole uh, breeding cycle. And uh, here we see on the left uh, the maximum inspiration and on the right the maximum expiration situations. You, you, you can see that here we do not see the lesion anymore because it's displaced inferiorly in inspiration by the motion of the diaphragm and the motion is still there in expiration. But you can also see two things that are very important. First, the boundary of the lesion is much more defined here than here. And the, the lesion is even bigger here than here. But on the other hand, we have a problem here and here, which is the low signal-to-noise ratio. I'm sure you can 
see that the image quality, if you look at this region here, for example, in the mediastinal region here, is much less defined than here. This is because with gating, we are losing a lot of information. If we use, for example, five phases, and we get just maximum expiration like this, we are discarding 80% of our counts. Okay? So the signal to noise ratio that we get is much uh, worse here than here. And you must be aware of this. So one problem is how many phases do we use in 4D PET to get a good information? Let's go back to this one. If we want to recover the full quantification for information, we must use nine to 10 phases or 11 like here, okay? But if we do like this, we must be aware that we have a problem of signal to noise ratio, which might be very, very low. So maybe the optimum number of phases is around here. I will tell you what is the choice that we have made in our center. We, in our center, we have made this choice. We, if we need the 4D CT, we just need, uh, use five phases up to now. Why five? Five because if we start, okay, this is time. This is percentage of a respiratory cycle from zero to 100, okay? Generally, the systems that uh, allows you to do a 4D PET use 100% uh, to describe full uh, inspiration, okay? Then the respiratory cycle goes down like this. At 50% of the time, yes, 50% time, you get full expiration and then it goes up again and you get 100% which is once again full uh, inspiration. So this point uh, is the same point here, okay? You start uh, uh, from the beginning from here. The maximum expiration point uh, is exactly in uh, uh, the middle of this graph. Well, if you use uh, an, an even number of phases which might be four or six, uh, you have a division of your graph that splits maximum expiration in two. If you use an odd number of phases, like three or five or seven, you ha get a situation in which your maximum expiration is correctly described by one single phase, like this. So the choice was between three, five, and seven, okay? between three, five, and seven. If you look at this graph, if we use three, the signal that we get is quite low, okay, once again. If you use five, this is a very extreme case once again, but in the vast majority of cases, if we use five, uh, we get an underestimation of the SUV, which is no lower than 10% compared to the maximum, okay? So the uh, choice was if we use four D pad CT, we just use five. Uh, uh, five phases. Of course, there can be more refined uh, strategies to, to use the 4D information and to recover the wool uh, signal to noise ratio. For example, we could use uh, one of the techniques of uh, the formable registration that we have seen in the first talk. With the formable registration, we could uh, do something like this. We have a 4D CT data set here. So this is, for example, maximum inspiration and this is maximum expiration, say. We register each single phase to the three-dimensional phase with no motion control, and we get N maps of the formable registration. Then we take the whole path without motion control, and we apply the inverse transformation to get the single phases in path. This is called the virtual 4D path strategy, and allows you to recover both the real shape uh, and uh, the uh, SNR, the signal to noise ratio, and the activity of the region. But once again, these strategies are not like in the formal registration commonly implemented in commercial systems. 
okay? It's still uh, in uh, the research uh, stage. So you just have to be aware that it is probably coming in the next uh, years, but not yet, uh, not yet available. Uh, okay. For all techniques uh, of organ uh, imaging with organ motion, we, we have to rely on tools for uh, quality control. One of the tools of quality control that we can use is the one that you see here. This is a, a motion phantom, which has an important two important characteristics. First, it can describe uh, both the motion of the surrogate signal, which is the block here, the external signal, and the motion of the real tumor inside the, the, the lung, right, like this. And second, it can uh, be uh, driven with a real, uh, for example, log file taken from a, 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 a system that describes uh, the, the respiratory motion of the patient, and uh, uh, in this way, it's able to, to describe a real motion and not just a mathematical model like a, a sinusoidal or uh, something like that. These two characteristics are very important because they allow you to describe exactly what uh, you get in the real patient. And of course, uh, tools like this are not the only tool that you have for, for uh, quality control of, of techniques uh, that uh, uh, manage uh, motion. You can also make an analysis of log files of the system, make consistency checks, uh, for example, see if the volume is preserved in inspiration, in expiration, to have a, a real um, description what is, uh, uh, what is uh, happening in your system. And of course, you cannot uh, uh, make uh, anything without the expert judgment of a, a physician that uh, uh, says you if you are taking the wrong or the right direction. I would like to finish this part with a, an example of a decision tree or whether you have to use, a, it can be for the PET CT in our case because this is a, an example of a, a, a decision tree we use in our center, but you can as well apply it to for DCT without PET to make the decision if we need for a 4D technique or not, we first of all see if the anatomical region is affected by respiratory motion and the patient can tolerate the procedure. For the first part, the region affected by respiratory motion, we normally estimate five millimeters of displacement as a minimum. If the patient can tolerate the procedure and needs uh, an, explicit, an explicit technique for respiratory motion like this one, we estimate lesion excursion. If the patient cannot tolerate the uh, procedure, of course, we discard the, the idea. If the motion is uh, greater than five millimeter, we make the decision to use for DCT or for the PET CT with five phases. Uh, for the reason for the for the reason I have uh, already told you, if the motion is smaller than five millimeter, we go to a standard uh, planning imaging. And once we have the uh, the four D pad CT, we see if we have a close proximity between the target and the organs at risk. If there is a close proximity, we choose uh, the phase uh, which is. Uh, uh, the one that allows us to spare the organs at risk. If we, not ha we have no proximity to the organs at risk, we, we use generally maximum expiration because it is the phase in which the patient uh, spends more time during the breathing cycle and which is more reproducible compared to the other. And then the phase which is chosen is uh, used to, to build uh, the PTV and then the PTV with, with the setup errors and so on. So in conclusion, tumor motion or organ motion must always be considered and uh, accounted for, but it's not always necessary to do an explicit management of respiratory motion, okay? Sometimes it's really too complicated, uh, too long for, for the patient, too long for your clinical activity to be performed. Explicit methods for motion management might prolong treatment time and introduce significant uncertainties. For example, we have seen the uncertainty that we introduce if we do not a proper 
uh, we, we do not take into account properly the full uh, for the uh, information in tracking. Uh, we need a temporal coherence, which is always necessary between imaging for planning and treatment administration. And we also need to put in place a quality assurance program that allows us to validate our technique and uh, see if we are taking any, making any important mistake. And finally, it's always necessary to make a balance between accuracy and clinical applicability of, of, of the study, which can be a, a very refined technique that allows you to, to do uh, very nice things, but maybe it's too long for, for your clinical work. So in my opinion, it's always necessary to, to do a proper balance between these two aspects. Okay, that's all, and thank you very much for, for your attention once again. <laughs>